The Secret Service has scripted where Donald and Melania Trump can step out of the beast, as the presidential limousine is called. At those points, counter-assault teams stand ready, armed with fully automatic Stoner SR-16 rifles and flashbang grenades for diversionary tactics. If they spot any hint of a threat, the grim-faced agents never betray it. They never tell. Because Secret Service agents are sworn to secrecy, voters rarely know what their presidents, vice presidents, presidential candidates, and cabinet officers are really like. If they did, says a former Secret Service agent, they would scream. These agents are at constant risk. They've pledged to take a bullet for the president. Ronald Kessler, a former Washington Post and Wall Street Journal investigative reporter, is the New York Times best-selling author of books on the Trump White House, the Secret Service, the FBI, and the CIA. Kessler's book, In the President's Secret Service, Behind the Scenes with Agents in the Line of Fire and the Presidents They Protect, tells the inside story of what our presidents are really like. You know, I love to penetrate secrets about organizations and people that are important. In the case of the Secret Service, uh, they are so important that if you have an assassination, it nullifies democracy. But at the same time, the Secret Service, as the name implies, is really very, very secretive, more than even the CIA or the FBI, which I've also written books about. Uh, so it was a challenge. I love a challenge. And uh, it's also important to know what our leaders are really like. And this book, uh, In the President's Secret Service, tells what they are like in terms of their character, in terms of how they treat other people. Uh, so all of that comes together to, I think, give you quite a read. Americans want both openness and security. These goals have competed in the minds of presidents who want to be with the people, but also remain safe and alive. The history of the Secret Service is surprising. Protecting the president was almost accidental. In 1865, the agency began operating as a division of the Department of the Treasury to track down and arrest currency counterfeiters. Perhaps the most infamous assassination was the death of Abraham Lincoln at Ford's Theater in Washington. Honest Abe was guarded by just a single DC police officer who decided to leave his post and have a drink at the nearby Star Saloon. John Wilkes Booth's lethal gunshot to Lincoln's brain changed history. And then on July 2nd, 1881, Charles J. Guiteau fatally shot President James A. Garfield in the back. While Congress began giving the Secret Service limited authority for guarding the president through occasional funding, that did not help President William S. McKinley, who was shot by Leon F. Zalgus, a self-styled anarchist while being guarded by agents in 1901 in Buffalo, New York. He died eight days later. Despite three assassinations, protection of the president remained an afterthought. It was not until 1902 that Congress gave the Secret Service full authority for protecting the president. The uh, Secret Service assigns code names to their protectees. The president, the, the uh, first lady of the family, uh, is originally, uh, there was no encrypted communication. So uh, they wanted to refer to the protectees without anybody knowing what they were talking about. Now, of course, they have encrypted communications, but they still use code names because, first of all, they might be in a crowd, they might be talking about President Trump, they don't want someone to hear his name, and so they have uh, a uh, code name, which is Mogul, uh, a, uh, a name that he chose. Uh, in addition, uh, they don't want to have confusing names you know, for a family, uh, so if they have a code name uh, which begins with the same letter of the alphabet for each family, for example, the Clintons uh, are uh, Eagle for President Clinton, uh, Evergreen for Hillary. Uh, in the case of the Trumps, it's, it's Mogul, and then uh, Muse for Melania. Uh, the names are generated by the computer just randomly. They eliminate any uh, swear words or, or words that might be uh, incomprehensible. But then the protectees have the right to choose their own code name. 
Despite the dangers, most Americans expected their presidents to be accessible and saw assassination as an occupational risk. For decades, any citizen could easily walk on the White House lawn. After the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the Secret Service ended public access to the White House grounds, installing gates around the perimeter. Well, first of all, the White House is in the center of Washington, uh, bounded by these uh, busy streets. Uh, that alone makes it a, a good target. It was not until World War II that uh, the grounds were finally closed off so that people couldn't just wander in whenever they wanted. The um, Secret Service Uniform Division was created to protect the White House itself and the grounds, uh, whereas the Secret Service agents are assigned to protect the president, the first family, the first lady. Uh, and so uh, there's that division between the Uniform Division and the agents. As its name implies, the Uniform Division consists of officers in uniform, which work alongside a heavy armed division. They also have counter assault teams, which uh, are armed with very heavy weapons, uh, which can go in to supplement uh, regular agents. In addition, uh, Secret Service has counter sniper teams, which are stationed on uh, rooftops, for example, to take out anybody who might be a threat along a, a motorcade route, or in the case of the White House, uh, someone uh, who might be trying to uh, get into the White House. In the case of the White House, it is surrounded by a fence, but it's not a very effective one. And over and over again, uh, assailants have, have scaled the fence uh, and the Secret Service takes them out. They either bring them down with dogs who are cross-trained to uh, sniff out explosives or take, it, take down an assailant, uh, or they will shoot them. However, the public is most familiar with the agents in suits wearing earpieces. These agents are responsible for the security of the first family and the vice president and his family. They also protect former presidents and their spouses, presidential candidates, and visiting heads of state. They are responsible for security at special events, such as presidential inaugurations, the Olympics, and presidential conventions. By the end of World War II, 37 Secret Service agents were assigned to protect the president. The stepped-up security paid off. At 2.20 p.m. on November 1, 1950, two Puerto Rican nationalists tried to force their way into Blair House to kill President Harry S. Truman. The would-be assassins, Oscar Colazzo and Griselio Torresola, hoped to draw attention to their cause for independence. Leaving the East security booth, Agent Boring and Officer Davidson drew their pistols and opened fire on Colazzo. Well, it was an attempt to kill Truman did not succeed. Uh, the the uh, gun battle that ensued uh, at Blair House when Truman was staying there, uh, involving these two Puerto Rican nationalists, uh, was, was just a big, big gunfight, just like out of the Western movies. Uh, and uh, the result was one uh, Secret Service uh, uniformed officer was killed. Uh, also, one of the uh, Puerto Rican assailants was killed. Uh, and of course, that finally demonstrated how important it was to have a real Secret Service with a real protective mission uh, to, to protect the president. The biggest gunfight in Secret Service history was over in 40 seconds. A total of 27 shots were fired. Congress finally gave permanent statutory authority to the Secret Service to protect presidents, uh, as well as uh, vice presidents. Later, after the assassination of Bobby Kennedy, the Secret Service also assumed responsibility for protecting presidential candidates. Before being hired, agents were taken to a range for target practice with a pistol and were handed a manual. There was no other initial training. Many had served in the military and had firearms experience. Today, new agents are given 16 weeks of training at the James J. Rally Training Center in Laurel, Maryland plus another 12 and a half weeks of training at a federal training facility in Georgia. On a giant parking lot at the rally center, new agents drive chargers and learn to make the J-turn, making a perfect 180 degree turn at high speed by going into reverse, jerking the steering wheel to the right or left, then shifting into drive. 
Secret Service agents observe everything that goes on behind the scenes, but they are told to keep mum on the president's personal life. It wasn't until Gary Hart had this affair with Donna Rice when he was running for president that uh, the personal lives of presidents and candidates finally came out. The President's Men, Tales from the Secret Service. Agents assigned to guard President John F. Kennedy soon learned that he led a double life. He was the charismatic leader of the free world, but he was also a cheating, reckless husband whose aides snuck women into the White House to appease his sexual appetite. Kennedy also had several consorts within the White House. One was Pamela Turner, who was Jackie's press secretary in the White House. And of course, in those days, the press would never report on any of these uh, personal activities. Uh, it was just understood that you don't do that. Two others, Priscilla Ware and Jill Cohen, were secretaries who were known as Fiddle and Faddle. They would have intimate threesomes with Kennedy in the White House. One day, uh, Phil and Paddle were in the White House pool with JFK. The girls were wearing only a T-shirt, uh, their nipples showing, and uh, the Secret Service uh, notified JFK that Jackie, his wife, who had just left the White House, had decided to return unexpectedly. Uh, so JFK got out of the pool, but he's very cool about it. You know, he gave his, his Bloody Mary to an agent, and he said, try it, it's quite good. Secret Service agents also learned that Kennedy would have sexual relations with Marilyn Monroe at New York hotels and in a loft above the Justice Department office of then Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy, the president's brother. The Secret Service found out that uh, JFK would have these liaisons with Marilyn Monroe in a uh, sort of uh, attic area above the office of the uh, Attorney General in the Justice Department. Uh, and of course, Bobby, uh, his brother, was, was Attorney General, so it wasn't any big deal to make use of this area. Uh, so just one little example of, of what the Secret Service picks up, uh, not necessarily observing it, but learning about it. According to the Warren Commission report, before Kennedy visited Dallas on November 22, 1963, Kennedy aide Kenny O'Connell told the Secret Service that unless it was raining, the president wanted to ride in an open convertible. So we arrive at Love Field. Uh, we had the special car that we had flown in to use in San Antonio, and then we moved it from San Antonio to Dallas, and it was the cars were waiting for us. That car was a Lincoln, specially fabricated automobile. It had a, the capability of a plastic bubble top being used. But we had instructions from the president that the only time that that bubble top was to be used was if it were inclement weather like rain or snow, or if Mrs. Kennedy's hair was going to get all messed up because the wind was blowing too hard. President Kennedy was codenamed Lancer, and Lancer told agents he wanted the public to see him. The advanced protocol included no inspection of buildings along the motorcade route. At 12.30 p.m., the president's limousine was traveling at about 11 miles an hour as it entered Dealey Plaza. Shots resounded in rapid succession from the Texas School Book Depository. A bullet entered the base of the back of the president's neck. Another bullet then struck the president in the back of the head, causing a massive fatal wound. The president collapsed to the left into his wife Jackie's lap. You know, the JFK assassination is an example of how presidents uh, can be reckless and, and, and don't want security and they want to be out there with the public and they don't want to be accused of, of being uh, prisoners in the White House. And so when the Secret Service wanted to have two agents ride on a rear running board of uh, JFK's limousine in Dallas, he refused. He didn't want it. He thought it would look bad, you know, too much security. If Secret Service agents found Kennedy to be reckless, Lyndon B. Johnson was uncouth, nasty, and often drunk. He was sworn in as president on November 22nd, 1963, the very day of Kennedy's death. But President Johnson shared something with his predecessor, an insatiable appetite for sex, including with young secretaries in their offices. 
You know, we, we hear a lot about JFK's uh, liaisons in the White House, but very little about Lyndon Johnson. Uh, Lyndon, Lyndon Johnson, in, in some ways, had an even more active sex life than, than JFK. He had uh, relations with uh, the majority of his eight secretaries. He would go to the home of one of the secretaries. Uh, he would tell the Secret Service to just leave him there and come back later. At one point, Lady Bird Johnson caught him having sex on a sofa in the Oval Office with one of his secretaries. Johnson blew up at the Secret Service, said, you should have warned me, and he demanded that a buzzer system or alarm system be set up so that the Secret Service could warn him when Lady Bird was approaching in case he was having sex. Agents and Air Force One crew members recall that Johnson was often totally naked in his stateroom with his daughters, Lady Bird, and female secretaries around. He would then uh, hole up sometimes in his uh, stateroom in Air Force One with a pretty secretary, uh, even when, when Lady Bird was there. Of course, again, none of this uh, showed up in the press. The understanding was you never write about these things. Kessler says after examining the private behavior of our presidents, reckless behavior and judgment might reflect policy decisions. Look at how it played out in the case of Vietnam. He, he pursued that war with, with no basis whatsoever. Uh, here is a guy who was really wacko. One, one agent said if Johnson uh, were not president, he would be in a mental hospital. If Lyndon Johnson was out of control, the Secret Service found Richard Nixon and his family to be the strangest protectees. Nixon, codenamed Searchlight, did not sleep in the same bedroom with his wife, Pat. Lyndon Johnson consulted Lady Bird on issues he faced. She was an advisor, but agents said that Nixon seemed to have no relationship with his wife, almost like she didn't exist. As the Watergate scandal progressed, agents recalled that Nixon got very paranoid. He didn't know what to believe or whom to trust. He thought at the end, everyone was lying. Nixon was a, turned out to be somewhat of a uh, loner. You know, when a person is elected to their office of the president, one of their big things is they're now going to be in the Oval Office. Well, Nixon had the Oval Office, but he then established an office for himself in the executive office building, which is adjacent to the White House right across a little street. And he spent considerable time in that office, a lot of times alone. While Nixon rarely drank before the Watergate scandal, he began drinking more heavily as the pressure took its toll. Each night, he would down a martini or a Manhattan. Richard Nixon uh, would drink. He was very sensitive to drink. He would take uh, two Manhattans, and, and he would be just flying high. And he started drinking more heavily during Watergate. Nixon would walk on the beach wearing a suit. All of his suits were navy blue and dress shoes. Even in summer, he would insist on having a fire burning in his fireplace. One evening, Nixon built a fire in the fireplace at his San Clemente home and forgot to open the flue damper. And the whole home became filled with smoke. The agents came running. One of them said, where is the son of a bitch? Couldn't find Nixon. Nixon was in another room. He heard this and said, son of a bitch is over here trying to find my socks. Uh, so very, very strange guy. The President's Men, Tales from the Secret Service. Of all the perks, none is more seductive than living in the 132-room White House. Servants are always on call to take care of the slightest whim Laundry, cleaning, shopping are provided for. From three kitchens, White House chefs prepare meals that are exquisitely presented and of the quality of the finest restaurants. Dr. Bertram Brown, an acclaimed psychiatrist and aide to President Kennedy, describes the White House as a character crucible. He says it either creates or distorts character. And people who want to go through the grueling abuse to run for office and become president are often people who crave superficial celebrity. Even if you are a balanced person, how do you stay that way? Secret Service agents found Gerald Ford, codenamed Passkey, to be a decent man who valued and respected them. But agents were also amazed at how cheap Ford was. Especially after Ford left the White House, he became so cheap 
that when he would uh, go to a golf course, he would tip the caddy one dollar. And back in those days, a you know, typical tip was fifty dollars. Of course, today it would be much more. On September 5th, 1975, Lynette Squeaky Fromm, 26, drew a Colt 45 semi-automatic pistol and squeezed the trigger as President Ford shook hands with a smiling crowd outside the Senator Hotel in Sacramento, California. Bystanders said Ford was shaking hands with everyone and smiling when suddenly he turned ashen and froze as he saw a gun being raised only a few feet away. Secret Service agent Larry Bundorf had already noticed the woman moving along with the president. As Fromm pulled the trigger, Bundorf jumped in front of Ford to shield him. He then grabbed the gun and wrestled her to the ground. It was later determined that she had cocked the hammer of the gun. Fortunately, there was no bullet in the firing chamber, but four in the gun's magazine. Fromm was a disciple of Charles Manson, who had been convicted of the ritualistic murders of actress Sharon Tate and six others. Two months before the assassination attempt, Fromm had issued a statement saying she received letters from Manson blaming Nixon for his imprisonment. Just 17 days after the Sacramento incident, Ford was leaving the St. Francis Hotel in San Francisco when Sarah Jane Moore, a 45-year-old political activist, fired a 38 revolver at him from 40 feet away. You know, one of the uh, would-be assassins of, of Ford, Sarah Jane Moore, was the only person who was on the Secret Service uh, protection threat list before her attempt. Oliver Sippel, a disabled former U.S. Marine and Vietnam veteran, was standing next to Moore. He pushed up her arm as the gun discharged. Although Ford doubled over, the bullet flew several feet over the president's head. It ricocheted off the side of the hotel and slightly wounded a cab driver in the crowd. Secret Service agents Ron Pontius and Jack Merchant quickly pushed Moore to the sidewalk and arrested her. As bystanders screamed, the agents pushed the uninjured Ford into his limousine and onto the floor, covering his body with theirs. Ford got this bum rap that, that he was clumsy. In fact, Ford was a great athlete. He would uh, ski uh, very, very expertly. The Secret Service had to assign a, a very good skier to, to protect him on the slopes. Uh, so uh, again, a tremendous contrast between the public image as projected by the press and the reality. The President's Men, Tales from the Secret Service. The Secret Service's Technical Security Division, TSD, installs devices at White House entrances to detect radiation and explosives. Populated with real-life versions of Q, James Bond's fictional gadget master, TSD sweeps the White House and hotel rooms for electronic bugs. While electronic bugs have never been found in the White House, they are occasionally found in hotel rooms because they were planted to pick up conversations of previous guests. When Ronald Reagan was to stay at a hotel in Los Angeles, for example, the Technical Security Division found a bug in the suite he was to occupy. In protecting the White House, the Secret Service employs what are called canine units, mainly Belgian Malinois. The dogs are cross-trained to sniff out explosives and take down an intruder. The Secret Service refers to a possible assassin as the Jackal. The Secret Service operates knowing that a Jackal will most likely strike when the President has left the safety of the White House. Today, uh, you have a whole bunch of agents go out two weeks before uh, they check for possible threats. They go over the parade route, the motorcade route, uh, they have 3D uh, mock-ups. Uh, they check the uh, identities of anybody on the uh, motorcade route. Every assassin has pounced when a president is most vulnerable and always outside the White House, usually when arriving or departing from an event. That window of vulnerability opens several times a week when the president leaves the White House for an event in Washington or goes on a domestic or overseas trip. The Secret Service checks on the backgrounds of employees preparing food for the president. Agents even watch the preparation of the president's food. 
If the Secret Service considered Richard Nixon the strangest modern president, Jimmy Carter was known as the least likable. Jimmy Carter had this uh, jovial, peanut farmer, good old boy image that he projected. The truth was quite the opposite. On the one hand, uh, he would purposely uh, make a show of carrying his, his own luggage to Air Force One or to a limousine. Uh, but then as soon as the cameras were gone, he would give it to, uh, a, to uh, others to carry. Um, the truth was, Jimmy Carter instructed the Secret Service not to say hello to him in the morning on, the, on his way to the Oval Office. That's what the guy's character was really like. Uh, he treated agents like, like serfs. In one case, in my book, In the President's Secret Service, I quote an agent who drove Carter for over three years, and he said in that whole time, Carter never engaged in any conversation with him. The only communication was about driving direction, directions. Uh, so unbelievable contrast between what the public was fed by Carter versus what this guy really was like. Jimmy Carter, codenamed Deacon, was moody and distrustful. When Carter would um, visit at Blair House after he became president, he would actually take down uh, portraits of previous Republican presidents and replace them with portraits of himself. That's what a, an egomaniac he was. President Ronald Reagan was one of the most liked presidents by agents. The nation's 40th president treated Secret Service agents, the Air Force One crew, and the maids and butlers in the White House with respect and consideration. President Reagan was very, very considerate of Secret Service agents. They loved him. Uh, whenever he went into Air Force One, he would go into the cockpit and greet the pilot as opposed to Jimmy Carter, who did that only once during his whole term. Uh, and uh, one day, uh, Reagan came out of his home in Los Angeles, and he was carrying a pistol. And one of the agents said, what's that for? And he said, just in case you guys need some help. Codenamed Rawhide, Reagan confided to one agent that on his first presidential trip to the Soviet Union in May 1988, he had carried a gun in his briefcase. But the warm feeling of the Secret Service didn't extend to Rainbow, the code name for Nancy Reagan. Agents described her as cold and demanding. One day, uh, a White House usher uh, went in to see Nancy and uh, her dog started nipping at this usher, and uh, the usher went like that, and Nancy said, don't you ever wag your finger at my dog. At 2.35 p.m. on March 30th, 1981, John W. Hinckley Jr., 25, fired a 22 ROM RGI-4 revolver at Reagan as he left the Washington Hilton Hotel after giving a speech. Members of the public had been allowed to greet Reagan as he left the hotel. No one had been screened. By inserting himself into that crowd, Hinckley was within 20 feet of the president. This is something that the Secret Service covered up, the fact that they bowed to this pressure from the White House, which they never should have done. But that was why uh, Hinckley was able to, to almost kill Reagan. Instinctively, Agent Timothy McCarthy hurled himself in front of Reagan and took a bullet in the right chest. It passed through his right lung and lacerated his liver. Well, everyone yells, Mr. President, Mr. President, no matter who it is, they yell. So I look back at the president, he's going to that rope line, I have to be right next to him on the right side. Uh, but he kept coming towards me, so I went and looked back at the crowd and I looked to the right. John Hinckley was to the left, uh, almost by the wall. He pushed himself forward and he fired six rounds in 1.4 seconds. And that was out of a revolver, not a semi-automatic pistol. While Secret Service agents and uniformed division officers have been wounded or killed during protection duty, McCarthy is the only agent to have actually taken a bullet for the president by stepping into the line of fire. And he hit uh, Tom Delahanty, a District of Columbia policeman, in the back of the neck. Uh, Tom retired. As a result of that injury, uh, Jim Brady, a fellow Illinoisan, was shot just about between the eyes and his life was altered. And his life and his relationship with his family and, and, and his son at that time were altered forever. Uh, I was hit in the right chest. 
Agent Jerry Parr was with Reagan in the limousine. He noticed blood coming from the president's mouth. You want to go to the hospital or back to the White House? Well, as part of any trip, uh, the Secret Service uh, plots uh, any emergency locations, hospitals, police stations, fire stations where they might go to hide. Uh, and, and so, of course, they had everything planned out and, and they immediately brought uh, Reagan to George Washington Hospital. Going straight there probably saved his life. Reagan was, you know, within minutes of, of dying, uh, uh, almost died in the hospital. Uh, of course, that was all kept secret at the time. At one point, Reagan opened his eyes to see his wife, Nancy. Honey, I forgot to duck, he joked. Surgeons found a bullet that had punctured and collapsed a lung. It was lodged an inch from Reagan's heart. As a result of the Reagan incident, the Secret Service began using magnetometers to screen crowds at events. Similarly, the Secret Service learned lessons from the John F. Kennedy assassination. It doubled its complement of agents, computerized and increased its intelligence data, increased the number of agents assigned to advance in intelligence work, created counter sniper teams, expanded its training functions, and improved liaison with other law enforcement and federal agencies. George H.W. Bush, codenamed Timberwolf by the Secret Service, was considered a great man, an all-around nice person by his Secret Service detail. The Bush family were extremely thoughtful and considerate of agents. Uh, they would make it a point to be at the White House during Christmas so that the agents could be with their families during that time. But uh, I remember one Christmas Eve, I had just finished, I was working in the afternoon, which is an evening shift, and I'm getting ready to go home. And Mrs. Bush calls, and she says, Bobby, come into the kitchen. And so in the kitchen in their home in Houston, it's not very big. They had all these gifts, you know, fruit baskets, things that people were sending them. And she says, here, take a pick. And uh, the president comes in, and he says, here, Bobby, take this. And it was a big box. And inside was a, a pecan pie, Texas baked, of course. And he says, take this home. And he said, you know, take anything else that you want. And that's how they were, just very giving. Barbara Bush also was very, very considerate of Asians. She would actually offer to do their laundry when they were at Kennebunkport. Uh, one day, uh, she noticed that an agent did not have a hat. It was very cold out. Uh, she uh, told uh, the agent to take uh, Bush's hat. Uh, and uh, the agent didn't want to, but, but Bush said, you better do what Barbara says and he did take the hat. Despite warnings from his detail, Bush had a habit of leaving the Oval Office through the door to the Rose Garden and greeting tourists lined up along the fence on Pennsylvania Avenue. After a story ran in the Washington Post about this, agents noticed a man in the crowd who exhibited all the characteristics of a possible assassin. It was summer, but he was wearing an overcoat. He looked disheveled. Everyone else was smiling, but he was not. Sure enough, when agents patted him down, they found he had a pistol on him and likely would have used it on the president. Bill Clinton, codenamed Eagle, was often one to two hours late for many meetings. Former Secret Service agent William Albrecht says for President Clinton, a scheduled time was a suggestion. Sometimes Clinton was late because he was playing a game of hearts with his staff. Other times, he ignored his schedule because he wanted to chat with a janitor or hotel worker he happened to meet. He loved to talk with ordinary people. In the case of the Clintons, uh, Bill Clinton would schmooze with agents, uh, but he also had what they called Clinton standard time, which meant that he was typically an hour or two late for everything. Uh, and that was a big problem with the Secret Service, uh, whereas Hillary was so nasty that to, to this day, she's still protected by the Secret Service as uh, a wife of a former president, that she is considered the worst assignment in the Secret Service. Being assigned to Hillary is considered a form of punishment in the Secret Service. She'll just look for any reason to blow up at agents, even 
if if they go over over a bump in the road in a motorcade, uh, she'll blow up at the agents. She will actually, when she was in the White House, uh, say that she doesn't want agents to be in her line of, line of sight, so that when she was going through a corridor at the White House, they would have to literally hide behind curtains or go into adjoining offices so that she would not see them. That is how pathological she was in terms of, of, of dissing the Secret Service. Hillary Clinton uh, did not want police officers or military at her, at her events. Uh, she just had a, uh, uh, she had a real hatred of, of uh, people who are there to protect her. I mean, this is just unbelievable. The President's Men. Tales from the Secret Service. The Secret Service was tested on September 11, 2001. Well, the 9-11 was a big test for the Secret Service because they had to uh, protect not only the people in the White House uh, and, and get them into the basement, but also uh, find uh, Laura, who was over at the Capitol. Of course, she was being protected. They brought her into the basement of the Secret Service. In the case of uh, Dick Cheney, they, they, they hustled him out of his office. He said, what's going on, what's going on? They, they just hauled him out. After returning to Washington and landing at Andrews Air Force Base that fateful day, Bush rode on Marine One to the White House. During such national emergencies, the Secret Service works with the military to ensure continuity of government and coordinates protection of those in the line of succession to the presidency. When Barack Obama was inaugurated as America's 44th president, the Secret Service faced a rising threat matrix. Obama was America's first black president race problems continued to persist, and there was a growing concern that Obama could suffer the fate of other black leaders, including Dr. Martin Luther King, who was struck by an assassin's bullet in 1968. Just before and after Obama's inauguration, threats against him soared by 400% compared with threats against Bush. Most of the threats came from white supremacists and were racist in nature. Obama and his wife Michelle treated agents and still do, they still protect them with, with respect and consideration. Uh, however, agents were dismayed to overhear Michelle urge uh, Obama to side with blacks uh, on a regular basis when there was a police shooting uh, without knowing any of the facts. The surprise election of Donald Trump was also a surprise to the Secret Service. Trump was greeted with immediate protests on election night. Activists descended on Trump Tower in Manhattan. Wherever Trump goes, political opponents dog him, raising new concerns for the Secret Service. A celebrity before he became president, Trump enjoys plunging into crowds and receiving adulation from his fans. Before his inauguration, friends urged Trump to remain in his limousine during the ride from the Capitol to the White House. He ignored the advice and twice emerged along with his family members. While previous presidents enjoyed the security of a weekend retreat at nearby Camp David, Trump prefers to golf in Virginia, New Jersey, and Florida, posing security questions. Trump vacations at his Florida retreat, Mar-a-Lago, a private club with 400 members located in tiny Palm Beach. The Secret Service has to rely on hundreds of local police and support personnel from the military and Coast Guard to fully secure what Trump calls the Winter White House. Trump uh, treats his agents with respect and consideration, and Melania does as well. Um, I asked uh, Trump, uh, as we were at Mar-a-Lago overlooking the pool, how do you like being protected by the Secret Service? And he said, it's great, you know, I'll have 20 agents all around me while I'm playing golf, and they're all looking in different directions. And if I miss a shot, they don't see it. Trump has a habit of canvassing anybody he sees uh, when he's gonna make a decision. And he does that with the Secret Service. So no matter what the issue is, no matter how big, no matter how small, he will ask agents, what do they think? about this decision. And uh, it, it's a way of communicating with, with the so-called common man to get their opinion, as opposed to just White House aides who may or may not give their real uh, 
with you. Since its inception, the Secret Service has played a major role in ensuring that America's leaders remain safe. No one knows how many assassination attempts have been prevented by the brave agents who stand on constant guard. But what we do know is, if the Jackal targets the President, the men and women of the Secret Service are ready to give their lives to protect the leader of the free world.